Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Jessica Kennedy and I am the Public Programs Manager here at the Eamon Carter. Um, we're excited to have uh, such a full crowd tonight. The exhibition, A New American Sculpture, 1914 to 1945, Lachaise, Laurent, Nottleman, and Zorak, examines those artists' contributions to figural sculpture during the interwar period. Laurent and Zorak were best known as leaders of the direct carving style. <clears throat> it was a moment when artists were following a truth to materials philosophy. Since the museum has not presented a special exhibition on sculpture for several years, we've invited tonight's speaker in the hopes of expanding our understanding of three-dimensional art and the direct carving method in particular. James Searles was born in East Texas and graduated from Sam Houston State Teachers College in 1966 and from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 1968. He taught at Southern Methodist University in Dallas from 1969 to 1976. He then moved to Splendora, Texas with his wife, Charmaine Locke, and lived there for over 20 years, raising their seven daughters. <laughs> since 1997, <laughs> since 1997, they have lived in the Roaring Fork Valley of Colorado. Searles has been a part of many solo and group exhibitions and is in the collection of over 50 museums worldwide, including the High Museum in Atlanta, the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City, the Portland Art Museum in Oregon, the Guggenheim in New York City, and the Museo de Art Contemporano de Caracas in Venezuela. Among his proudest accomplishments include the exhibitions Visions at the Dallas Museum of Art in 1984 and 85, In the Meadows in 2003 at the Meadows Museum, and James Searles' The Splendora Years, 1977 to 1997, at the Blackford Gallery Art Museum at the University of Houston. Each of these exhibitions were accompanied by a book, and the most recent book showcasing his work is titled James Searles, From the Heartland, published by the Grace Museum in Abilene, Texas. He is also particularly proud of his involvement with the Lawndale Alternative Space in Houston, where he spent wonderful years with many great friends. Please join me in welcoming James Searles. I also had a one-person show at the Lovelady Elementary School lunchroom. <laughs> you just have to be willing to say yes. <laughs> Bondale was yes years for me. I said yes to many, many, many artists. And they did really strange things. You know, they would put up shows that no one else in town would do. They couldn't tear up the building. You know, it was a very freewheeling, and I truly loved it. Um, <clears throat> I went through the show upstairs. Uh, it represents a strata out of uh, our history. And it's close enough, in a sense, to my history that I can kind of grandfather it in. You know, I can take it in as part of uh, my, the world I came out of. But realistically, <clears throat> the, um, the world that we all came out of um, really started back when a group of hunter-gatherer types were walking down a dry, rocky creek bed and someone leaned over and picked up a round bulb of stone and rolled it in her hand. And I say her because I think that what came next would be a her thing to do. And I think what came next is she felt the stone and looked at herself and knew the feeling of life inside a bulbous form and she rubbed the stone and in essence imbued the stone with life and deemed it to have meaning have life in it, and hence, I think, she gave birth to art. I think by the fact that she projected onto it means that she also uh, gave birth to science and to philosophy. I think she had triplets. <laughs> we have come a long way from that, but the guys upstairs <clears throat> were still using 
that reductive method that nature was using in tumbling the rocks, taking the edges off, making the form smooth, concave or convex. If you could master the curve, you could be Michelangelo. You know, if you could master the curve, you could then portray anything physical that you could visualize. Mostly, they visualized um, the figure. They visualized themselves. They visualized what they saw. In the philosophic world, it is said that how would you look up into the sky and see a chicken in a cloud if you did not know what a chicken was? You had to know what it was in your head to project that onto the cloud. Otherwise, it's just a fuzzy cloud. But because you have an image, it becomes something. This <clears throat> is like the first rung, first ring out from the center of my youth as an artist, which was carving a piece of wood down to a something. Stone carvers carved a piece of stone down to a something. They chisel, chisel, chisel. They whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked on it till they broke it off and could smooth it and rub it and rub it and rub it and rub it till it became a polished, smooth surface. That's the nature of how the object, art as an object, came into existence. I think I may be kind of in the last strata of that world. You know, I, I may be the last man standing in a 30,000 year period of history. Um, it's conceivable because I know many artists today who don't really even have studios. They work with a design team. They actually design something and they, the, the team then puts it out to get fabricating bids on it, so it is made. Um, this piece was showed in the Fort Worth Modern uh, back in 75 or something like that. Um, it's, it's called Shovel Man. It's actually called that long title, but <coughs> I just called it Shovel Man. Um, it came from a ponderosa tree that the forest department had deemed a rogue. Now it's hard to really think about what a, how a tree would become rogue. Um, I picture this tree is running through villages tearing up clotheslines. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, the top of it was dead and it had been struck by lightning before and they were afraid that it was going to be struck again and break off parts of burning pine and start a forest fire. So they were going to cut it down. So they sold it to me for two dollars. Man, that's, that's a good price. <laughs> <laughs> this was a big ponderosa tree. All these components that you see on this shovel man came from that log a uh, part of it. Uh, there's another sculpture that's part of it as well. <clears throat> I want to speak for a minute about meaning and content and message and metaphor and what is it? What does it do? What does it say? What's the, what, what's the message here? You know, uh, by look, why, are you, why are you looking at this piece of art and when you do, do you see something? Does something speak to you? Um, I always wanted my art to do that. I thought that was part of the goal, if you would, uh, to have it do that. <clears throat> I used to sit on the side of a mountain in Kit Carson uh, uh, Forest out in New Mexico, and I would watch thunderstorms come up that Rio Grande Valley, and you could see 50 miles across there, and you could see a thunderstorm develop Sometimes you could see two come together and form one. And then you could see this big, dark, 
cloud with just spitting fire and lightning and, you know, hence the fire in the sky, throwing fire from the sky. I pictured myself, which I would do this, I stood outside and let the storm pass over me. I like to froze to death. Um, it actually is pretty stupid in one sense. I mean, you couldn't, I wouldn't suggest it to, uh, uh, to most people. But as a, an experience in nature, you know, as, as an event in nature, um, it's pretty moving, you know, to be inside and witness on a first-hand level uh, that kind of natural phenomenon. Um, this piece came out of the same log. This piece was also shown at the uh, Fort Worth. I, I don't know if it was called the Modern then. Maybe it was. Oh, it was? So I've shown it to Fort Worth Modern, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and this was one of them. This is, this is my wife. This is Charmaine. This is, this is titled, She Brings Gifts to Me. I have made a lot of sculptures about being handed the gift, you know, receiving the gift. I did a drawing <clears throat> a couple of years ago called I Am In The Goodbye Glove, where the tidal wave is the big wave, and what you get is what you gave. And it's about kind of in a finishing well mode of, of my life, you know, what do I want to give? And I, I, I think that, uh, I think of all those dictators, like that steal hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, and then they can't even go back to their hometown. You know, I mean, what was all that about? You know, I mean, I'd rather be able to go back and visit my nephew, Philip, you know, than live somewhere where I don't get to see anybody. I mean, sometimes people do things that are really strange, you know, and their motives are really weird. But this one is a female in a universal sense. It's a female giving a gift, um, like she gave us that, those triplets, you know. I actually have worked that out in my head where it, it serves me well, you know, the harmonic balance uh, between the matriarchal and the patriarchal. And there's probably a million utterances in uh, poetic history about the female kind of in a way uh, setting the pace and saving some situation, you know. <clears throat> it can be a golden thread that she gives to Jason to find his way out of the cave, you know. It can be, um, it, it has shown its way it has shown itself in many, many different kind of uh, metaphoric uh, ways, but I think it's okay, and I still do. I, I'm telling you, I still do. I, I think it's okay to make angels. I think it's okay to make spirits, you know. I think it's okay to dwell in that world. <laughs> Charmaine says, well, that's great, man, that's good. As long as you can come back and take the trash out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are certain obligations to reality. <laughs> this one came out of the same forest. It was just left laying in the field. They didn't even want it. This, this knotty, curly pine tree. I thought, man. There's not another pine tree on the planet looks like this one, and they didn't want it, you know? So I loaded that up, too. This is Charmaine and I in, uh, in uh, up near uh, Niagara at Art Park in Lewiston in something or other. I don't even remember the date, 76, I guess. Um, man. Wordsworth used to write about how glorious it was to be young and in Paris during the Revolution. You know, <laughs> I mean, we all lived in a period where there was viable energy, you know, and uh, for goodness sakes, I go out in the middle of a field near Niagara Falls 
and start chopping wood like I knew what I was doing. It's like I, I was there a month. I worked on this thing for a month. I brought it back to Texas and took it over to Waco to, to, uh, for a show. And then it sat there for 20 years and the entropy just ate it. You know, it wasn't treated, although that wouldn't have made much difference. Robert Hughes, a Time Magazine critic, wrote about this sculpture as being um, as a tornado chewing up a church. And I thought, well, <clears throat> I don't see anything. There's not a hair out of place on the church. <laughs> you know, I don't think the tornado is chewing the church. I think the tornado is a force coming from the church. That's the way I meant it. And that's the way I made it. Um, I've made a lot of pieces about churches, you know, and about the, the house, the hearth, you know. The... I've also made a couple that are pretty nasty. Um, <clears throat> this one's called Burning Dog. You know, there's always, uh, I gotta say this. I just, I mean, this is this is as, as Charmaine would say. You're going into the weeds, James. Careful. Uh, <clears throat> when I was born in 1943 in rural East Texas, I got to grow up at one and two and three and four years old, playing along creek beds, making little roads and creek beds, and playing in the woods and making forts and running with my dad's uh, hound puppies, you know, uh, in fields chasing jackrabbits. And, I mean, I had an idyllic kind of, of life in what I call nature's lap. But at the same time, <clears throat> a person who later became friends with me, and I became friends with her, I will say, her name was Alice Kahana. Alice Kahana was in Auschwitz. She was in Auschwitz. And she was like 12 years old. And she made, she organized her, her pod, her group, her room, whatever, her compartment of 23 girls. And she gave each one of them a straw out of a broom. It was the only thing in the room was a broom. She took a straw and gave each girl a straw and the girls made a circle and held the straw up as light. And the guard actually gave her a can of snails for that effort. And I've always thought to myself, <clears throat> you know, regardless, um, Man, I, I could have the best life on the planet, but that doesn't mean everybody is. You know, I mean, there was, the world was imploding when I was being born. You know, the world was literally eating itself, and millions and millions and millions and millions of people were being killed, and I'm over here playing in the sand, you know, having a good time, which I think <clears throat> is really the way children should be. They, all children should be able to be in that realm. Um, so where does burning dog come from? There's a lot out there that I can make some pretty nasty sculptures about. And I have. Um, this one's called Hurricane. This one is, um, was shown at the Guggenheim in a show I had there, and, and it's still there. They bought it, I mean, so it's in their collection. I, Charmaine did research on the stump in American art. Well, man, the stump shows up a lot in American art. <clears throat> you know, I mean, the early Americans stumped their way across the land. You know, they would twist big stumps with horses, with teams of horses, and twist them until they broke a taproot to get them out or they would wring them and the limbs would die and the branches would fall and they would make a pile and, but they made places to plant, you know, to grow, 
to survive. So <clears throat> winning, winning over the forest was actually a goal. That was a, so this is an ax on the stump with a spirit coming out of it. Um, and birds coming out of the spirit. I, I make this association between uh, birds and spirits and so does probably every poet that's ever lived. Um, literature's riddled with the idea of a bird at your window, a bird on the windowsill, or, or a bird in the apple tree b beside the front door, you know, and you, you give that moment some kind of extra meaning. This is Charmaine and I in the woods. What could be better than living in the woods with her? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. This is called working in the garden. This, this stump literally came out of our garden and I dug this stump out with my girls. My girls had little cans of water and spoons and they'd pour the water around the roots and they'd scrape it with a spoon and they basically, they excavated this as little, as little kids and loved it. It was fun. I mean, it was like a major feat uh, to do. But working in the garden is like a whirlwind of activity. Uh, this was taken in the New Orleans Museum. I love shadows. I've got in a kind of a little bit of a mental scuffle, if you will, with some um, high-end art dealers who wanted clean and well-lit and washed walls and, and um, very minimal in terms of show space. <clears throat> and I came from the uh, parrot and the jungle school. <laughs> so the shadows, I, I love the shadows. I, it was great. This one's dead. I made this for a guy in Tyler, a guy named Bob Buford. Uh, <clears throat> Bob and I went on to become great, great friends. He's not in good health now. Uh, but he was uh, a true believer who gave, dedicated his life to giving. And he made lots and lots of money. And he gave away lots and lots of money. This is called Pass. Um... Charmaine and I lived in a one-room house in the woods for five years. And it never so much as slowed us down an inch. We'd have a dinner party for 60 people, you know, and, and we just wouldn't go in the house. <laughs> <laughs> We'd just eat in the yard. And if you cook in the yard, I mean, it just makes everything easier, you know. I mean, it's like it's just... Pass has um, three and three. I still use that figure. That still use those images of three things and three things and, and the power of that number. Three is a powerful number in forever culture. Every culture on the planet. Three is a big, big, important number. Uh, there are three eggs in the nest. And it's like... In a way, it's like gone forever. The wagon, <clears throat> the thing that I knew and saw and could relate to as a little kid, by the time I got to be in high school, and nobody had wagons. You didn't go anywhere in a wagon. You know, that was completely gone. This is called Balance. It's um, a character on on standing on one foot and he's balanced by these two staffs uh, they're pretty direct as to what they are <clears throat> I think if um, if you as a spectator look at art whether it's my art or someone else's art regardless of whose art it is and you asked a few basic questions about what is it and what's it saying and what's it telling me what does it mean what's it symbolic of 
what's the metaphor in this, you know? I mean, there's got to be something that gives you a punch other than just, and I've used this one before, and Charmaine told me to quit using it, <laughs> but it's like having a beautiful wife with a lobotomy. And people say, oh, she's beautiful, what does she do? And you say, nothing. <laughs> oh, you know, uh, you don't want Charlie Tuna. You don't want something on the wall that just looks good. Looking good is really not enough. It's got to have some significance, some meaning, some content to it. Um, now, all that good-looking art on your walls, leave it. Don't go, <laughs> don't go taking it off. <laughs> uh, this is called Immensity. I built this for Carol and Bill McKay out in Granbury uh, many years ago. That little red-headed girl I'm holding there is, she's now like, uh, oh man, she's 40, I think. I, I forget. Uh, this one rotted too. I made a whole, I made like 20 pieces that were steel and wood and they went outside and I treated them, I put them in pressure cookers, I took them to uh, you know, pole pressure cooking places and, and they still rotted. So I don't do that anymore. Now I'm spending a good part of my time collecting them back and trying to get them rebuilt and I want to put them all in one room. I won't put them back outside because they'll rot and fall again. But walking through immensity is there are places in Texas that have that as a, that's, that's a real thing. It is immense, just the feel, the sort of the, the, the you breathe deep the air of immensity. Oh man, night vision. Night vision was in the Whitney in a, a um, critic for the Soho News wrote about this piece as being a beautifully horrific nightmare. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's a, how do you use those words together? Uh, but this is about Charmaine and I being in a hayfield at night, you know, and uh, you just, it's just starlight. You're just seeing what's in the, and so the, the night is, everything is black except your eyes and but the character's holding his hand out. He's got, he's, got a, he's got his hand out offering, in a sense, a certain degree of peace. He's holding a flower. He has a flower in his ear and one stuck in the side of his head. And he's coming out of a um, very voluptuous house. You can't see the front of it, but take my word for it. <laughs> so, I, you know, I mean, a lot of people can look at your art and paste their world on it and see whatever they want to see. But I do make art with intent, uh, with a concept in mind. This is called Needle Man. I, man, I used to, uh, I used to read a lot about <clears throat> passing, things passing through. You know, you. It really came from the concept of a calling, that you get a calling to do something, and then you do it um, virtually without question. You become focused on whatever it is you're called to do, and you can really, you can really just go in deep into it. And there are certain musicians that can do that, and certain writers that can do that, and there are certainly certain dancers that can do that, but. I always th have thought that <clears throat> if you wanted to play in the big leagues, baseball, let's say, <clears throat> if you could, you have to be able to catch the ball, run the bases, throw the ball, hit the ball. You know, there are certain things that you have to be able to do just to get in the game. All that does is let you in. Now, past that point, you've got to have something else. There's got to be something else that's driving, that's driving you to take it to a higher level. And I think maybe that's what a master is. A master is someone that can take it to the higher level. To do that, you got to rule, you got to throw a lot of things out. 
man, you got a, you got, you, you got a big trash pile over here because you got to get rid of a bunch of stuff. I mean, psychological stuff to get there and to really be focused uh, to do it. I cannot imagine anything more important to me than making my art other than my wife and my family. I mean, that's it. That's, that's, and, and I really have those all melded into one real focus. Needleman is in a state of um, projection. This one, um, this one the Whitney bought. Um, you know, needles may indeed represent something that has to do with warp and weft and thread and fabric and making things and sewing things and warmth and protection and uh, things that are brought about through a certain strata of our society and culture. But the knives, on the other hand, boy, that's a whole different ball game. Um, I mean, consider, if you will, when she was discovering the triplets. Uh, he had a lion after him. He, he, had to, he had to do something. He had to protect. He had to set up perimeters. He, he, had, to, he had to actually not only be on the defense, to survive, he had to be on the offense. I dare say he may have taken that stone in his hand and, and uh, hit a hyena on the head, you know, something, or fought off something that was there to render harm. So I think males and females have indeed gone in several different uh, kind of psychological directions. Me and the butcher knives is personal but it's also universal. This one's in the Smithsonian. It's a, it's a church for a head. I love the steeple. I mean, I'm kind of infatuated with the steeple. It's like putting something on top of a building that's reaching up and pointing to something that's, and with every, every move, it just keeps pointing higher and higher. I think it, I looked at it as kind of uh, symbolically representing aspirations or ascension that you are elevating uh, up. Um, the Bauhaus period cut the heads off buildings. They made them flat. They took the body away. When a building looked like a body, it looked like a human. It looked like a person. It, there was a... a a, a, an immediate association made with it. And then the buildings went square and rectangular and all melded in as one big block of something. Um, but the ax and the wand as two powerful tools. The wand is equally as powerful as is the ax. Meat man and the bait fish. Charmaine. Looking out of our kitchen. Man. Charmaine told me, she said, James, I'm moving to Colorado. Would you like to go with me? <laughs> I said, well, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is called Gone Forever, man. I mean, we've driven through the South, through the South, through the South, through Alabama and Mississippi and the Carolinas and Louisiana and East Texas and you're going down a little narrow two-lane hardtop blacktop road and you look off and there's a house sitting there and it's it's now kind of seriously gray dark and it's dilapidated and the tin roof is rusted and 
as a rule, there's like some old implement sitting out there by it, you know, some kind of farm-related implement thing. And there'll be a clothesline with nothing on it, but it'll just kind of have all, and a smokehouse and an outhouse, and you know, it'll, it'll have all those, uh, those peripheral trappings of what was used to support life. But it's just, it's gone, you know, the whole thing is gone. It's just not applicable anymore. Um, so that's what, this, that's what this was about. This was at um, the Meadows. This was in the Meadows Museum. As a matter of fact, I think this was, well, I don't know where it's taken, but... You know, the table of plenty, the, the, the bountiful table, it's, uh, it's been used over and over and over and over and over in literature and, and in uh, visual art um, and paintings and sculpture. And, um, but I love the idea of the picture of flowers. And the picture is like a, just sort of a figment in a way. It's like a drawing. It's pretty ghost-like. This is at the meadows. <clears throat> There's those old tacky shadows again. <laughs> <coughs> There's a needle coming out of this bridge. Um, I use the needle a lot. I mean, I use the needle and the axe, and I use the diamonds. And <clears throat> Moving forward, this is hanging down through uh, three floors of building, and then... Uh, on 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. It's on between the 23rd and 27th floor, I think. Uh, I love doing that stuff. You know, it's like a unique space with unique conditions and a unique individual at the driving wheel. And that's what it takes to do that. You don't do that with a committee. You know, you do that with a unique individual with his hands on the driving wheel or her hands on the driving wheel. <clears throat> I wanted to put in a couple of drawings. Um, Coleridge was the first artist really to get kind of saddled with the phrase complete fragments. Um, I think it's because he was, uh, you know, a laudanum addict that he, that's what I hear, <laughs> <laughs> that um, he would enter into a moment of writing with a fever, just, I mean, I mean, just with a desire, I mean, deep into it. And then as the night wore on and he got tired and he went to sleep, the next morning he couldn't, when he woke up, he couldn't remember what he was doing. You know, and the critics always kind of accused him of like just cutting something off. So they coined the phrase complete fragments, that it is a fragment complete in and of itself. And man, I love to draw. I mean, I can get lost in the, I can just get lost in the good times you know, just lost in the moment uh, of drawing. A, a character that's reaching out, uh, making music, uh, making language. Um, I thought, man, <clears throat> life is a bunch of, com you know, complete fragments. They have to become holes in and of themselves. Um, I've had several things that happened to me in my life that actually changed the trajectory of my life, a moment so intense that, um, you know, that it, it, changed, it changed me. It, I, it had an effect. One was leaning over a, a barbed wire fence on a, out on the uh, east side of Taos, going up toward the Kit Carson National Forest and seeing a standing over a fence looking at a penitente church and in an amazing 
a sense. There, there, there were graves all around it, and the graves were made of just wooden sticks tied together with hubcaps and beer bottle caps and egg cartons and plastic flowers and just incredibly well built, brilliant, but of just found material, just stuff that was available. They would take sacks, you know, uh, would you get at the grocery store and tie them in knots and make things and put them there like a big fuzz ball of flowers on a stick. <clears throat> I, I really was moved by seeing that and it was a, during a particular weather event where the light was, the, the sunset light was hitting it and just washing it with this beautiful sunset and I'm standing there going, oh my God, look at that, you know. I think that it would be great if art could do that, you know, that's part of, that's part of the deal, you know. Artists at one time believed in that kind of ascension moment in their art. Um, I don't know if it's not, if it's gone, I'm not going to tell you it is, um, but I, like all of us, I, Charmaine and I went to the a Whitney Biennial like 25 years ago and there in the lobby was a big Santa Claus hanging up and he'd been cutting the inside of his thighs with a razor blade. And I thought, yep, there you have it. <laughs> I mean, really? Come here, kids. <laughs> Art, art, art is, art is really has been exploded. It's been that somebody has blown it up. I'll leave this one up while we do questions. Any? Yes, please. When you are outdoors, you're seeing things that the church or a thunderstorm and such. Do you have a, a photographic memory of that? Do you take a sketch? Or do you use a camera? How do you transfer that that image that trans? That moment to sculpture. Well, picture, if you will, um, a poet laying on a couch, and he is um, deep in contemplation of a field of daffodils that he had seen two years before, and he revisits the field. He knows that if he had gone into the field in real. He would have stomped the field. He would have mashed the field. He would have killed, made a sort of a disastrous path in a way through the field of golden daffodils. <clears throat> so he pictured himself as a, a vapor, air, a, a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud through the field of golden daffodils. You know, and he did that two years after the reality of having seen the fields of daffodils. So I don't know that artists need pictures in that sense, in the, in the true sense. I don't think that you really are trying to take a one-to-one -one transi trans transition, whatever. I think what you are doing is you are taking the best the moment had to offer. And then you are, in, in a sense, you are now putting that within your vocabulary and your language and your repertoire of iconic stuff, you know, and you're molding it into something that's yours. It's now a whole new statement, but it's a good question. It's a, it's a, it's a question that's been around a while. <laughs> Any other questions? This is your chance, guys. Yes? I'm also about how your drawings and your sculpture <coughs> each other or yeah they don't um I, I will repeat it yeah she asked about the transition between a drawing and a sculpture or when does this this as a drawing then come back and then directly influence this as a sculpture the ones that i do that are to be made in head rendered and then made in sculpture uh, physically, I call those sketches. I will sketch something. I can sketch a church with a tornado coming out of it. I can sketch a figure, 
you know, doing this. I, and I sketch those. And then, yes, there's a direct correlation. But the drawings, like this as a drawing, this is titled, All I Ever Wanted Was to Go Home With You. Well, that kind of sums it up, you know. That's all I ever wanted to do, you know. Uh, but this is cosmic in a sense. This is like looking at something that's uh, 300 million light years across, you know. It, it goes out into the depth of the universe, you know, so it's, uh, it's expounding a lot. But poets do that. One of the greatest poems I've ever read was uh, uh, Robert Creeley, So Simply Vast. So Simply Vast, placed in this space everywhere. That's the poem. That's the whole entire poem. So simply vast. <laughs> Boy, that, you, you just went out to the edge of that. You went out to the edge of the universe. Placed. <laughs> now you come right back in. You point right to this spot. So now he took you out and back within three words. Poets can do that. It's hard, it's hard for artists, visual artists, to do that. Everywhere. In this place, everywhere. Man, he just took you right back out again. You know, um, I love that. I love to live in that space. I think, I think that's where um, um, who dropped the marble in the shot glass? Who made the little wooden boxes? And Joseph Cornell. Joseph Cornell. I mean, mm, God, he was he good or what? You know, he he could drop a marble in a shot glass and take you take you to outer space. You know, he, all he did was. <laughs> that was it. But guys, I really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much.